Welcome everyone, I'm Brett Whitney here to tell you about a wonderful new book from Knopf that's hitting the bookshelves on 30 March 2021. It's titled A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life and Epic Journey of the World's Smartest Birds of Prey, and it's written by my friend Jonathan Myberg. Jonathan is himself a most remarkable creature, a thinker, a wanderer, a scientist, an artist. And along the way, he's a chronicler and interpreter with a sort of a two-headed penchant for looking back, always with respect, even homage. At the same time, he's looking forward, usually with an eye to impending upheaval. And that's the treat you have in stores. You get to know Jonathan Myberg, the author, and Jonathan Myberg, the musician, the front man and principal singer-songwriter for the highly acclaimed band Shearwater. A most remarkable creature is an emotionally fortifying book, pensive and enlightening, and it's a highly entertaining read. Man, congratulations on publishing this book. It, it's, how are you feeling? It must be pretty exciting. Uh, well, as, as, we're, as we're filming this, it's about a week away from publication. Oh, it's and so it's, great. It's been since the first time I met striated caracaras in the, in the Falklands, which is this bird depicted on the cover. Uh, it's been almost 25 years. So, this is the end of a very long journey for me. Uh, and I, I have to, to tell you that, uh, the, the, Brett, you actually were, have been very helpful in, in allowing me to put together this book, because even though you don't appear in it personally, you're behind the scenes quite a lot. We did a trip together in the Amazon uh, that didn't end up appearing in the book, only for reasons of, um, you know, it would have gotten un unbelievably long <laughs> and uh, and then also there's this section that takes place in northern Chile where we went up to the Atacama um, and so you were you were very present throughout this book for me in the well, writing I, of it. Yeah, thanks I, I certainly felt present all along I remember the day that you told me that you were going to be doing this book and I thought only Jonathan is going to <laughs> write a book about Caracaras and you know I've read your your master's uh, dissertation, which you got right here at the University of Texas, right? Yeah, uh, with Robin Dowdy, and uh, the it was a, a book. It was a that was it wasn't a book, but it felt like a book. Yeah, that was in the geography department. In the right? geography department, yeah. which is this wonderful hybrid discipline, uh, because it sort of sits at the intersection of the arts and the sciences, and it's it's technically an art. Like you have you get an MA in geography. Huh. And so my thesis was about the biogeography of striated caracaras, which was the, taking this question that Darwin asked when he met them in 1833. Yeah. He's this 22-year-old kid in the Falklands. <laughs> and he meets these funny birds that are coming up to him and taking things from the crew of the Beagle and stealing hats and you know acting like winged raccoons. And he said, doubtless for some good reason, or this, this bird doubtless for some good reason has chosen these islands as its metropolis. But this was before he even got to the Galapagos, so the Falklands was his first real encounter with right. a group of islands where the wildlife was really, really strange yeah. and very tame. And that, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we know this is because the Falklands are basically about, along with the Galapagos, the only place in the entire New World that Europeans actually discovered. <laughs> but, uh, so these animals had not seen human beings until fairly recently, you know, within a hundred years of the time that Darwin saw them. And Darwin never really figured out where these birds had come from, why they were confined there. And that's sort of the, the MacGuffin of my book, is trying to answer that question of Darwin's that he set down and never returned to. Yeah. But to answer it, it turns out you have to go on a journey of you know, about 65 million years and take in all the different landscapes of South America and try to match the, the genetic journey of this lineage of these incredible falcons, yeah. caracaras, um, to what's happened to the landscape and the ways they've adapted to South America over such a long period of time. Uh, I wonder if you would read for us uh, the passage, a little passage from the book about your first uh, meeting with them. Yeah, um, one of the names that the whalers and sailors gave to them was flying monkeys, and flying devils. Yeah. Um, this is talking about what, what Darwin said. It said that the, uh, the riddle of the feathered thieves at the end of the world, now called striated caracaras, has remained. A few still live on the remote coasts of Tierra del Fuego, and the waras and gauchos vanished from the Falklands soon after Darwin's visit. Striated caracaras still cling to life on the archipelago's outer islands, where they hunt and scavenge in colonies of penguins, seals, and albatrosses. They are the southernmost birds of prey on Earth, and among the rarest, 
no more than a few thousand are left, a number only slightly larger than the wild population of giant pandas. But if you visit them, they refuse to behave like a species on the verge of extinction. They'll pluck the cap from your head, tug at the zippers of, tug at the zippers of your backpack, and meet your eye with a forthright impish gaze. And it's this earnest, playful quality, not their rarity or remoteness, that caught and held me when I met them 25 years ago. Striated caracaras seem disarmingly conscious, and they prod at the turf with their bills and feet and crane their necks to peer at everything with a keen but slightly dubious interest as if they've just emerged from the ark and wonder what else the world might have to offer. <laughs> it's just great. I, I love that. And, you know, uh, on an Antarctica tour that we did for field guides a few years ago, the very first birds to meet us when we got out of the Zodiacs on Carcass Island were the striated caracaras. Yeah. Uh, there were a couple of young, youngsters standing there saying, okay, here comes some interesting <laughs> yeah, it's items. Yeah, as if yeah. they, you know, it's as if they have exactly, they have just as much right to be there as you. Yeah. Yeah, here's another little section uh, from the book about the behavior of the the striated caracaras, which are still called Johnny Rooks in the Falklands. In fact, yeah. almost no one calls them striated caracaras in the Falklands. <laughs> right. It's always Johnny Rooks. Yeah. Um, on this uh, one island that we visited called Steeple Jason back in 1997, uh, young Johnny Rooks massed in loose groups that reminded me of the weasels who ransacked Toad Hall in the Wind in the Willows, and adult pairs defended slim territories on the edges of seabird colonies. They scurried nimbly among the albatrosses and penguins, trying to snatch their eggs and chicks, and swooped at us when we approached their nests. Unlike peregrines, who eat only fresh meat, striated caracaras seem prepared to digest almost anything. We watched them pluck fly larvae from mats of rotting kelp, dig in the turf for worms, clean the snotty nostrils of snoozing elephant seals, and tear into seabird burrows with talons they used to dig and grip like hands. These piecemeal, trial and error lives made them seem like the survivors of an ancient shipwreck, determined to wring a living from the island any way they could. When I first saw them running toward me at full tilt, I felt a shiver of cognitive dissonance. Aren't wild animals supposed to run away? <laughs> One bird yanked the knit cap from my head and landed just out of reach, fixing me with a wary, probing gaze. And as I walked the coastlines of the Jasons with Robin, I often looked down to see a winged shadow merging with my own, then up to find a caracara hovering a foot or two above me. If I stood still, they would descend by inches to tap me on the head and soar away as if inviting me to play tag. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a look at a few of your clips oh, of, yeah. of caracaras here. This and, one is, uh, uh, this is a young bird with, uh, with, with the, 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 investigating my hiking poles. <laughs> Wanting to know. Trying to decide what, oh, oh wow, what have I got here? Okay. Might this be useful? This? <laughs> <laughs> I've got something, you know, but what is it? What do yeah. I do with this? Now what? So he, he fiddles with these things for a while, and they're like this. They're interested in any new thing, anything they have not seen before. They want to know what it is and what they can do with it. He then decides he's had enough of this, and he's going to walk over and see what's going on with the backpack. Right. So it does that, and then you can see there's another one. He's been there all along. He's off having a look, and that's another young bird. This is on New Island. I just love this. Are you kneeling down there with a, yeah. a cell phone or something? Yeah, it's or just my you... phone. Uh -huh. yeah. That's how close you can get to them. This is just spectacular. It's such a stark and sort of mythical looking place. Oh, yeah. This is a dead sea lion that's, that's uh, long dead, but it's been softened by the rain, and there's a whole crew of striated caracaras. And this is in the book, right? This yeah. Scene? Mm -hmm. This is crazy. They're standing on each other's backs, and it's just like a scene from the Pleistocene, or you know, the Miocene, even, you know. <laughs> it's the young bird that's doing all the calling. Yeah. That's the correct. He's already got a full crop. He does, yeah, but he's now he's trying to say to tell everybody this is his, which they're not paying any attention to him, of course. Gonna be a troublemaker when he grows up. <laughs> Johnny rooks are, are they're very striking animals, they're easy to love, and in captivity in England, they do the most incredible things. There, I met a falconer who had trained one to recognize stuffed animals by name and retrieve them. Yeah. 
things that you could you just couldn't get a hawk to do right or oh, um no way or a, or a so-called true falcon right and you know we now know that um, falcons are more closely related to parrots than they are to other birds of prey yeah and i feel like you can see that similarity more in the caracaras than you can in the the true so-called true falcons that we think about more often when we think about that family. true much more one of these uh birds in england was named evita yeah <laughs> and what you said is uh evita seen at the right angle seems like she stomped right out of the cretaceous yeah. with her giant scaly feet predatory glare and sprinter's gait yeah <laughs> in your uh chapter four birth of a naturalist we get to know william henry hudson yeah and you know i knew him mostly for his wonderfully descriptive species accounts in the birds of la plata um, Got one of the original copies right here yeah a, 1920 mm -hmm. and i used to take that book uh, on field guides tours and read some of his entertaining always accurate passages to tour groups when i was developing our two argentina tours back in the late 1980s but i never studied hudson and I loved learning much more about him through your eyes, and I came away seeing him as almost heroic. Yeah. Uh, he was a, such a complex character. Uh, what would you hope that, that people unfamiliar with Hudson might find in him for themselves? He writes very beautifully about, um, about birds in particular, but really all kinds of wildlife and wild scenes, and people. His descriptions of people in some places are absolutely as detailed and uh, yeah. sensitive as his descriptions of birds. And I think that's sort of been uh, lost a bit in the way that people think about him when they think about him at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah the but, part three of your book is titled Solidly in the Spirit of Hudson Green Mansions. Yeah, the title of his most famous novel. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, which that's what's an interesting novel. The, in that it, it describes the tropical forest in Guyana. I went to the very place that he was describing in his imagination uh, to look for red-throated caracaras, which are uh, every bit as peculiar as striated caracaras, but completely different. They feed on wasps' nests in the tropical forest. And you, you went with a, a researcher, a Canadian fellow named Sean McCann. Sean right? McCann, What yeah. a character. <laughs> Boy, Sean is incredible. He's, uh, he's such a pleasure to be with in the field. Uh, I had never met him until I, I asked him, you know, would you like to go to Southern Guyana and, and look at these birds? Because he'd been studying them in French Guyana. And to make a, a very long story short, his, his research concerned trying to um, prove or disprove the suggestion that red-throated caracaras secrete some kind of wasp repellent. Because if they do, then that would make them, un, you know, unique among all birds. Absolutely. And. Uh, Although, as you know, I mean, toxic birds aren't unheard of. But Just recently, we found out about pitahuis in, in New Guinea. Uh, who have an alkaloid, right? Like the, it's like a homobotrachotoxin, I think. So the same as poison dart frogs in South America. And they, I think they sort of got onto that by removing birds from mist nets and realizing that their fingers, people's fingers, were going numb. Yeah, the, well, the story <laughs> I heard was that Jack Dumbacher took one out and he somehow touched his tongue and his tongue went numb. Yeah. That... And, and so the... Uh, uh, Anyway, so a toxic bird isn't, <clears throat> that's not impossible. But if, some, if a bird was able to secrete something that was repelling wasps, it would have to not just be toxic, but volatile. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, there, but there were a couple of observations of these birds saying that, uh, that as they were seen destroying these wasps nests, that the wasps weren't landing on the birds. And moreover, they have bare skin on their face and throats. Right. Which unlike honey buzzards, which also eat wasps and hornets in, in Asia and, and Europe, um, they're armored. They have these really thick scale-like feathers all over their faces. These guys have bare faces. Right. It seems crazy. A lot of bare skin. Eyes exposed. Yep. The whole, yeah. so it just doesn't look like something that would be easy to do, but Sean, being an entomologist as well as a, a fan of raptors, uh, thought this sounds like they're exploiting the swarm found, the, the behavior of swarm founding wasps, which are wasps who build Nests. I mean, you, you're familiar with them, the paper wasps, yeah, the wasps social right wasps, here. exactly. Polybiony. Yeah. Uh, they they will, as everybody knows, defend their nests if they're threatened. But they also, if they feel the nest has been sufficiently damaged that it's indefensible, that there's no sense in preserving it, they will stop. They don't just defend it to the death. They sound another chemical signal, and they abandon ship. 
abscond. Exactly, absconding <laughs> behavior. And then, I mean, then they, it, what they do after that is amazing. Like they huddle in a swarm, like honeybees, um, and they, uh, they send out scouts to find a new location for a nest. The scouts confer on the site that they like best. When they agree, they come back and they lead the swarm to the new location of their nest. Gosh. So, uh, you know, you develop a lot of sympathy for the wasps as you, you think yeah, about this. Right. But uh, Sean thought the birds are just exploiting this. They're figuring out how to damage these nests sufficiently that the wasps leave and then they can eat the larvae. Right. Because the wasps have to abandon their young basically when they do this. Yeah. And, uh, and that's very much what he found. He was able, after more than a year of work in the forest in French Guiana, building this insane bird feeder essentially, uh, which he attached wasps nest to he had <laughs> right. to find them in the middle of the night wearing a bee suit and then move them in such that the wasp didn't abandon the nest it's crazy and then attract the birds in by playing calls through a guitar amp I and mean, this just took forever to really really get that caracara resonant sound out there red-throated <laughs> red throated caracara the, the bush anti-man the bush right. anti-man yes which <laughs> i found out is what they're called in guyana now guyana as opposed to french guyana like People who've been on some of your trips will know that the Guyanas are a really an interesting part of South America. Yeah. Between Venezuela and Brazil on the northeast coast, it's three small countries that run from the from the uh, Guyana Shield up to the to the Caribbean. I took Sean to Guyana, the formerly British Guyana, where people speak English, including the Amerindian people who live in the southern part of the country. Wonderful accent. Too. Oh, it's, it's yeah, so great. Yeah, the the and people speak with a sort of a Caribbean inflection. There's words like vex and like there are no machetes in Guyana. There's only cutlasses. Cutlass, yes. It's, it's so it seems kind of piratey, oh, you know, so to, great. to my yeah. ears. These three men: Brian Duncan, Josie George, and Rambo Roberts, who are uh, Amerindian, um, and they took me and Sean on a trip up this river called the Rewa, uh, in the uh, in the southern part. Very of remote part of the world. Well, I was looking over yeah. maps of it with you and you were like, yeah, this looks great. <laughs> <laughs> to get up the yeah. Rio, we had to portage up these sort of large waterfalls. Well, like you that. know, it's uh, <clears throat> so rocky. Um, you know, this is pre-Cambrian stuff. I mean, really old great. part of the of the crust sticking up there. You're, you're completely going different from the Andes. It's like the, it's yeah. like the Smokies instead of the Himalayas. It's so much older than the Andes, way older. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great pains actually to try to describe Brian, Josie, and Rambo because um, because they talk in a way that's both intelligible but also different from the way that I do. Sure. They're very intelligent, very thoughtful, um, very observant. Um, I just felt as privileged as I could possibly be to be spending time with them in the forest and for them to share their lives and, and their experience with me in the way that they did. And you, you said that so beautifully. I mean, I. It, you know, I get tears in my eyes thinking about it, it even now. But would you, would you read that? Sure. Um, the, the I was so right there with you. It's on page two fourteen. And uh, oh yeah, right there at the end. Yeah, your your Josie has just told you a story. For, <laughs> it's such uh, a good story about character. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now we we mentioned the 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 that the red throated character as they called them bush anti man. Uh, Anti-man is a sort of pan-Caribbean kind of derisive slang term. No, anti, A-U-N-T-I-E. A -U, like, yeah, like, like anti. uncle and auntie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was mostly a term of annoyance because uh, they'll, uh, if you're hunting in the forest, the red-throated caracaras, if they see you, will, will let everyone know that you're there. So I think they were, they, you know, people who hunt in the forest were not fans of these birds. But Josie just decided to, to tell me this story uh, that was a story that his grandmother told him about. She used to tell him stories uh, about the days when the animals were people. So he's, so Josie's telling me a story that she told him about caracaras. It's a very ribald adventure concerning a black vulture, a caracara, and a dead horse. And I'll, leave, I'll let you discover the, the secret of this story if you read the book. But, the, uh, right. but after this event occurs, um, he says that the Karakara, uh, he's talking, he's describing a crested Karakara here. He says, and the Karakara laughed man with his head back so far like he does. And that is why the Karakara is always laughing and the vultures have no feathers on the head. And even today, it's still true. Crested Karakara is the savannah man, black Karakara is the river man, 
Bushanti man is the forest patrol security guy. And that is the story I have to tell you. Josie held my eyes for the entire tale, as if daring me to laugh. Then he looked down, suddenly shy, while I gulped down my tea. I wanted to tell him that spending time with him in the Bush Anti Man's ancient home had been one of the greatest privileges of my life, but I couldn't think how to say it in a way that wouldn't sound insincere, or worse, make him wonder if I was mocking him. So I'm saying it now. <laughs> uh, Brian was tried to get us as far up as he possibly could on the last day before we had to go back. Yeah. And for our final trip upriver, uh, it says Brian wanted to take us as far as possible with a stop at the creek where he'd wrestled a giant armadillo. He threaded the boat through a labyrinth of submerged and exposed boulders for hours until the ever-narrowing Rewa began to resemble the upper Chattahoochee in my home state of Georgia, a shallow rock-studded stream where the air smelled of raw clay and leaf mold. Trees undermined by the river formed natural arches above us, and green ibis and sunbitterns rested in their shade while barn swallows skimmed the river, visitors from North America, like me. Dead limbs lay so thick in the stream that Rambo had to clear them away with his cutlass, but Brian pressed on until a clear, swift creek called Anka entered the Rewa from the east. Beyond it, the river was too low for our boat to proceed, and I hopped out to savor a few minutes in the deepest part of the Guyana Shield that I would ever see. South and east of us lay a hundred thousand square miles of unbroken forest, a wilderness like no other on earth, and the late afternoon at its edge was so hushed and still that it seemed nothing might ever happen again. Sean lifted a stick from the ground that was still coated with dried mud from last year's rainy season, and I watched a pair of jacamars, needle-billed relatives of woodpeckers, sally into a sunbeam to snatch insects from the air and land among the huge silver-frosted leaves of a cecropia tree. At the stream's edge, the only animal tracks were the fine prints of a sandpiper, and I dipped my hands in the water and drank. It tasted as cold and pure as snow melt. Brian unbuttoned his shirt and leaned back against the outboard, gazing upstream. He seemed faintly disappointed. He'd hoped to take us to a place where the river was barely as wide as the boat, a place he'd seen only once in his life. There you will find Tapir, he murmured, so tame you can touch them. Oh, that's so wonderful. Later in the book, uh, you made a pilgrimage to Cornwall, a favorite place of Hudson late in his life. Yeah. And you were contemplating the fate of the strided Karakara in a changing world. Yeah. Um, I couldn't hold back the feeling that uh, you were you were almost suggesting that releasing some Johnny Rooks into the wild of Cornwall and Land's End was coming. Did Am I wrong? To, well, I, to... I suggest that they might do well in urban areas. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, on the well, one hand, you don't want to suggest introducing a threatened species into a, into a new course place. Not. It seems crazy. But I want to know what was going through your head. <laughs> but on maybe. the other hand, maybe because the, here's the thing is that the world is changing in ways we've never seen it change before. And if we're going to, the fate of these species lies in our hands. And if we're going to save them, if we want them to continue to exist, we may have to ask them to come in here and live in the world as we've remade it, not out there in some primeval wilderness. There's so little of that. And in fact, in some ways, it almost doesn't even really exist. There's no part of the planet that doesn't feel the effects of our species. And this one seems primed to want to live with us. They're just stuck down at the bottom of South America where there's really nowhere for them to go. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I would be very pleased, you know, yeah. <laughs> if, if striated <laughs> caracaras began to infest Land's End. I mean, this was the bird that got me interested in birds in the first place. Right. Yeah. And if you meet them, um, it's hard to resist this feeling. They're just the most, the immediately, there's something in their eyes that, that is um, uncanny. Yeah. You see something like you looking back. You know, I wanted to to hark back as I got got to the end of the book I wanted to go back to the to the first chapter and uh, on page 10 um, you know back to to Darwin's unanswered question yeah um, there's another little section that would be fun to hear you you read uh, it starts all the while Oh, this is after I've just imagined what it would actually be like to live with a Johnny Rook because I, I, I do fantasize about, you know, having one 
of my own, you know, but, but <laughs> yeah. it'd be a terrible idea. But, um, but I've met people who do, you know, these keepers who work with them in collections, mm -hmm. and yeah. they develop very strong bonds with them. They really are friends. They want to be friends with you in a way that most birds of prey simply do not. No. And um, I say that I, uh, I daydream about keeping a striated caracara in my apartment. This is back when I was writing this and I lived in New York. It would be the world's most exasperating roommate, but watching it build a nest of shredded t-shirts, LP jackets, and guitar strings in my bookshelf might be worth it. They, they do build <laughs> nests, by the way, which the true falcons don't do. Um, I can imagine it standing on my kitchen counter in the morning, tearing into a box of cereal with its beak, or cracking an egg with a blow from its clenched foot, which is how they break <laughs> penguin eggs, <laughs> then stashing, stashing a piece of toast under my chair, because they like to cache food, just like crows do, while I boil water for coffee. After breakfast, it might become absorbed in a dirty sock or a roll of paper towels while I try to figure out where it's hidden my keys. All the while, I'd be thinking of Darwin's unanswered questions and a few of my own. Why are you like this? Why are there so few of you? How did you come to be? Each time I've tugged on these threads, their story has grown larger and wilder than I could have imagined. Striated caracaras and their kin have surprising and important stories to tell us about the history of life about the hidden worlds of their grand and mysterious continent, about how evolution can fashion a mind like ours from different materials. They might even offer us some advice about surviving in a world primed for an upheaval. Yeah. I like the word upheaval for you. It's it's in your music and, and I now I see it in your writing. And you know, we're certainly living through a time of social and societal upheaval that do, well, you, do you think we can change. learn? Do you, you, do you think we're adaptable enough to make it? I don't know if we're as adaptable as they are, but maybe. It's certainly, I mean, humans, um, we hate change, but we'll get used to anything. It's the most contradictory. Reluctantly. Yeah. I mean, we just fight it. Kicking and know? screaming, but we will do it. Yeah. And that's, which is a very encouraging thing about our species. Sometimes I even actually think their immense capacity for waste and wastefulness is actually, there's some hope to be found in there because if this was us operating at maximum efficiency, we'd be screwed. Yeah. <laughs> but these birds have survived to, to meet us now um, by being very nimble. Right, you know, the, the upheaval is, is here, it's, it's upon us, but I, I'm an optimist. I, I really do believe that um, we can change for the for the better, and I think yeah. we're, we're I think we're turning the corner now. I really get the the feeling that, especially with young folks, and especially the the power of music, um, is is there to to sort of be a guiding light. I, I think we're going to make it. I think in some form that that seems likely to me. Um, yeah, we, we are it, very very people have been through a lot of disasters and come through them. Um, what music has to do with that, I'm, I'm, music is, it's a human, you know, Darwin was puzzled by music. Darwin, right. I, I, I love reading what you had to say about that. The, Darwin uh, thought that it was just this peculiar ornament that only humans had, and he couldn't think of really what its use was, except maybe in attracting mates a little bit. Right. And Hudson, reading this passage, <laughs> thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It's like, everything does music, right. <laughs> you know, like... Making sounds, yes. you know, is a is a uh, and and the pleasure of making sounds is common to uh, many forms of life, and um, that we're only an extension. Our musical ability is an extension of this, but it's not an invention. Yeah. And um, there there were times on the on the Rewa when listening to the the dawn chorus of the birds, where human music seemed completely primitive to me. Uh, it was so sophisticated. So many. I mean, let's. I think Bernie Krauss calls it biophonies, you know, where you have everything is um, in the same way that their niches and their, their food niches are partitioned into these tiny little thin slices of the habitat. They do this with sonic frequencies yeah. that, you know, uh, everything in order to be heard, it has to broadcast on a frequency that's open for it to be broadcasting. And so the more densely packed it is, the more uh, finely tuned the frequencies are yeah. so that you get just like with an orchestra these beautiful, rich, dense tapestries of sound that nonetheless are also very quiet. It's so eerie. I, I, was, I just was completely enamored by that, that experience.
and um, thinking about what it means to make sounds in those kinds of environments. Yeah, that's so interesting. You know, I can't, uh, I can't resist as asking you one last question here. Uh, yeah. Any plans for a next book? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already chomping at the bed, and this one hasn't even hit the bookshelves yet. I, yeah, a couple of people have asked me this already, and I just stare at them like, "Are you crazy?" I mean, this was <laughs> yeah. this it took such an effort to make this um, that the idea of jumping into something like that again right now, I kind of want to run screaming. At the same time, um, there's a screenplay that I'm thinking about writing um, that's been on my mind for a long time. Mm -hmm. That would be something completely different, and that's exciting to me. Um, there's also there is a book that I'm I'm thinking about, but it's it's at the very very early stages um, that would kind of dovetail with this one in some ways. But I, I feel like I don't even want to talk about it yet because I don't want to jinx it. Cool. Yeah. Well, talking with me wouldn't jinx it. Anybody else, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, neighbor. Yeah. Wow, great. Um, this has just been wonderful, Jonathan. I am so uh, delighted with the book. No, oh, thank you. Proud Brett. of you, man. I was um, I was I was great stuff. worried about what you would think about it. I was uh, like, God, I hope Brett's gonna like this. Oh, it's great stuff. It is. And uh, I love all the notes too, uh, in the back. Thank you. There's, the, there's really a, a wealth of knowledge. Some of my favorite there. stuff is in the notes including yeah, me too. Some, I, yeah, my editor I, asked me to, you know, to don't just put stuff in the notes because it didn't fit in the text. And for the most part I did that, but I did do it a little bit. You know, just div digressions that go just a little too far from the main narrative. Uh -huh. but like the, <clears throat> there's a poem about a wren that built a nest in a human skull, for instance, written by a guy who is known only for writing a book about English railways. You know, like <laughs> things that are you're <laughs> way, way out. You know, yeah. on the on the edge of a, of the digression. Uh, I caught myself a couple of times in there. There's there's a section that I where you talk about the uh, the distribution map of black cara cara what it would look like you, oh yeah this is a metaphor you, you gave to me yeah yeah you said an ornithologist friend uh mentioned to me that a more accurate depiction would be throwing a brick at a windshield right <laughs> yeah it's normally you see the whole amazon basin is included but yeah. yet most of the amazon basin you can't find black cara caras only along the rivers. they're right along the rivers yeah and so it's like that cracked dendritic pattern that, that goes out um around the basin. One thing you yeah. said to me a long time ago was that when you were a kid, at first you loved looking at the pictures of birds and bird guides. And then, um, but as you've grown older, you're more and more interested in the range maps. Yeah. And I had the exact same experience with this. Like meeting this bird led me into this larger story of what, uh, what the world, how the world came to be the way it is mm -hmm. and what it means. Yeah. And I think in some ways, it's like you could do this with almost any living thing and you would come away with a story just as, Absolutely. as big. Yeah. Um, this just happened to be the door through which I entered. Uh, such a wonderful gateway, uh, these caracaras. I am never going to look at these birds again uh, the same way. All of the caracaras. They're wind. <laughs> yeah, it's a win. Yeah, they're special. Absolutely. They're very... Well, our, our, friend, cool. our friend Julia Clark, the paleontologist who yeah. appears in the book, um, says at one point that in the towards the end there that the uh, uh i think this idea that the that the world is known is what keeps people from committing to a life of discovery yeah. and it's if there's anything i want people to take away from the book it's that that there is much more to learn than we know yeah um, despite you know and not everything can be found on the internet super message We'll leave you now with a Caracara's eye view of some of the diverse landscapes of South America, from the Guianas to Tierra del Fuego and the Falklands, as Jonathan and Shearwater perform South Coal and the Snow Leopard.
is the last one And let the moon do its work on your body And then to rise The forests and oceans of lies And through the light of the black rock
heart.